This is it. We are back. We are about to bring the 1950s era of Looney Tunes to a close at last. Last time there was a dip in quality, but the question remains, will that dip continue? And if it does, does it still manage to work in some truly great cartoons? Well, there's only one way to find out. But before we get into the actual review, a quick reminder that I have in fact started a Patreon page. If you would like to have your name listed right here at the start of every video and early access to certain videos, all it takes is a pledge of a dollar a month. And as always, if you've missed any of my previous videos in this series, the links to parts 1 through 8 are in the description below. Anyway, let's waste no more time and just dive right in. What's Opera Doc? And we're starting off this one with a real bang. With the cartoon that many people, and in fact many animation historians in general, cite as not only the greatest Looney Tunes cartoon of all time, but the greatest piece of animation ever made. And even though I can't go quite that far, it's also pretty hard to disagree with. First of all, just look at it. The scale and scope of this thing is unbelievable. This cartoon feels massive. And on top of that, the color scheme, camera angles, lighting, and imagery all complement each other to tell such a dramatic, dare I say, operatic version of the Elmer vs. Bugs story. Now, full disclosure, my exposure to operas is only limited to the Pirates of Penzance, so some of the opera references are going to go over my head. Like when Bugs disguises himself as Brunhilde, and he's on a really fat horse in a subversion of the opera cliche of the fat woman riding a horse. And yes, I did have to look that one up. But honestly, the genius of the cartoon is that you don't have to have seen a single opera to enjoy it. Because even on a surface level, this cartoon is equal parts dramatic and very funny. And yeah, there's also that ending, which might be the greatest Looney Tunes climax of all time. With Elmer being genuinely distraught that the woman that he thought that he loved turning out to be Bugs in disguise. And so he summons all the wrath of Mother Nature to kill Bugs. And then in a shocking twist of what you might expect, Bugs dies and Elmer feels remorseful over the act. But then it comes around and becomes funny again with Bugs' fourth wall break. It's such a powerful but also funny way to end the cartoon. And of course, the soundtrack is phenomenal. I mean, it's a cartoon that features some of Wagner's greatest music. So that's to be expected. This is a cartoon that Chuck Jones later said had six times the budget of all the other Looney Tunes cartoons, which he managed to secure by making a lot of Roadrunner cartoons, which were significantly cheaper to produce than other cartoons. And not only that, but it also took significantly longer to make. And that hard work, that dedication, and that passion all come through in the final product. It all comes together to form a product that is hard to deny is pretty amazing. This is one of the rare cartoons that I almost always want to go back and rewatch it immediately after finishing it. Tabasco Road. Honestly, we all deserve a mate like Speedy Gonzalez, looking out for his drunk buddies, even after they keep getting themselves into trouble. It's hard to argue this cartoon's pacing is that great, as most of the fight with the cat is made up of one joke in which Speedy slows down what he did so that we, the audience, can get a good look at it. But overall, it's an enjoyable, if unremarkable, time. But seriously, this was nominated for an Oscar, but What's Opera Doc wasn't. Birds Anonymous. What's ostensibly another Sylvester and Tweety cartoon on the surface is actually a surprisingly haunting allegory about the dangers of addiction, as Sylvester gets more and more unhinged and desperate as the cartoon continues, jonesing for a fix. And surprisingly, instead of solely being a conduit to tell jokes, it actually takes the subject matter somewhat seriously. This might actually contain Mel Blanc's finest piece of dramatic voice acting, as you can feel the distress in Sylvester's voice as he breaks down during the climax. It's extremely well executed and a finely tuned piece. Ducking the Devil this cartoon is interesting as it pairs Daffy and the Tasmanian Devil together in a typical chase cartoon. And instead of his screwball persona like, you know, you might expect, we get the cowardly, greedy portrayal of the character. I can't call this one great, but it's got its fair share of funny moments, especially the ending where Daffy's greedy side takes over and he breaks into the Devil's pen to fight him over a dollar bill. It's honestly a great way to end what's essentially a pretty basic cartoon. Also, as a little bit of neat trivia, 
It should be noted that this is the appearance where the Tasmanian Devil's more mindless eating machine who doesn't talk aside from grunts and growls personality actually began, as he doesn't have any actual lines of dialogue throughout the entire thing. Bugsy and Muggsy. This is basically a far less cruel version of Stooge for a Mouse, mainly because here the two victims of the gaslighting actually fully deserve what they get this time around. The gags are so similar it borders on being a full-blown remake, but honestly that almost doesn't matter because it is funny and features a peak Bugs performance. Zoom and Board. Out of all the Wily and Roadrunner introductions, this one by far is my favorite. From the slow realization that Wily is standing on nothing, compounded by the slow reveal that the Roadrunner actually is standing on solid ground. And yeah, the rest of these gags are pretty good. I especially love this one that sets up this big elaborate contraption, only for it to instantly blow up in his face. And of course there's the ending gag where the Roadrunner actually shows some compassion to the coyote for once. Greedy for Tweety. A surprisingly sadistic Sylvester and Tweety outing that asks the very basic question, just how much pain can we inflict on characters with broken feet? Apparently quite a lot. Sylvester seems far more evil than usual, and it's very welcome. Touche and go. A perfectly standard Pepe outing, not quite as hard to sit through as some of his more unsavory appearances, but not really anything particularly noteworthy in here either. The formula is kind of run dry by this point. Showbiz Bugs. This features peak jealous Daffy versus the universally beloved Bugs. Their rivalry feels particularly palpable here, as you feel Daffy's seething hatred at Bugs' popularity only increase as the cartoon progresses, which you could then make an argument is a commentary about, well, the nature of show business and how it's completely at the whim of the audience. And the slapstick gags in here are really good, albeit mostly recycled from older ones. The ending gag where Daffy blows himself up is recycled from Kurt and Razor, but it's done a lot better here, so I'm not going to complain. And the xylophone gag is also recycled from both the Private Snafu cartoon Booby Traps and Ballot Box Bunny, albeit with a xylophone this time instead of a piano. While not perfect, this one has endeared as a classic for good reason. Mouse Taken Identity I probably would have liked this one a lot better if, you know, this was the first or only Hippity Hopper cartoon. Because as is, this one's primarily a bunch of gags that we've largely seen done in other Hippity Hopper cartoons that came before it. But at least the cliches are done pretty good in here. Gonzalez's Tamales. So Speedy Gonzalez goes from being the best mate ever to the worst mate ever, going around and stealing all the pretty girls from his fellow bro mice. Anyway, this is largely standard Speedy versus Sylvester fare, although this gag where Speedy slowly disassembles Sylvester's gun is a great bit, and the ending pepper gag is... Man, that is just cruel. Rabbit Romeo. This is like a Pepe Le Pew cartoon, only with Bugs taking Penelope's place, and Pepe being replaced with a fat foreign rabbit. And Bob McKimson is not as talented as Chuck Jones to make such a premise work. The entire thing is just kind of claustrophobic and uncomfortable and not really that funny. Aside from this one joke where the goldfish kisses Millicent and then immediately goes into his castle to blow out his brains. Don't ax me. You know, Bob McKimson's cartoons were never the most fluidly animated by any means, but following the budget cuts from years previous, his cartoons by and large have gotten worse. But even still, I don't remember any of them being this bad. The animation in this is so choppy. One of the worst ones to date so far. But at least if the story and gags were good, it could at the very least be forgiven. But unfortunately, that's not the case here. The pacing in this is so slow. With almost two minutes devoted to an unfunny bit of the barnyard dog trying to convince Elmer's wife to serve roasted duck for dinner using charades, despite the fact that he can talk. The ending gag is about the only good thing in this one. Tortilla Flaps. Another pretty standard Speedy chase cartoon. And if Speedy wasn't in this one to elevate it with his mere presence, this one wouldn't be worth paying attention to. The only interesting thing in here is that this one features a variation of the those endearing young charms gag, with the crow getting mad at Speedy for not correctly using the ball in the cup game? In fact, what is that game called? 
Come on, hang on, let me look this up. Oh, it's literally just called cup and ball or ball in a cup. I was expecting something a little bit more creative. Hairless Wolf. This is what I would call the prime example of a Bugs cartoon that's decently enjoyable while you're watching it, but it won't leave much of a long-lasting impression. Honestly, though, this wolf is so stupid to the point of being practically brain dead. A Pizza Tweety Pie. More standard Sylvester and Tweety fare. The setting in Venice is utilized effectively enough, and the gags are fine without any real standout moments. And you know, I just noticed that Granny's abrasive, tough personality has been pretty drastically toned down, which is disappointing to say the very least. Robin Hood Daffy. Probably the greatest Robin Hood parody of all time. I forgot just how hilarious this cartoon is. These slapstick gags have just as much punch and perfect comedic timing as they did when I was a kid. Daffy Duck is perfect casting as the totally ineffectual Robin Hood, and the dynamic between Porky Pig Friar Tuck is also pitch perfect. Only Chuck Jones can make a cartoon where almost an entire solid minute is devoted to just one character laughing at another, and makes it so memorable and entertaining. Hairway to the Stars This Bugs vs. Marvin the Martian cartoon will always hold a special place in my heart, due to this being the one from my childhood. Why yes, I did grow up with the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, just in case you were wondering. I love the setting of this one. The red walkways and glass panels give this cartoon a visually interesting look throughout. And then there's the classic instant Martian just add water gag. And then there's the ending, which is equal parts hilarious and terrifying at the same time. Just an absolute delight. Woe Be Gone. Features some more classic Roadrunner gags, like this wheel on a helmet gag. This dynamite in the barrel gag, and this bit of the Roadrunner just messing with Wiley just for the heck of it. The slapstick timing of the Roadrunner cartoons continues to be nothing short of remarkable. A Waggly Tale A kid abuses his poor dog only to have a dream that he becomes an abused dog himself. This is basically a combination of A Kitty's Kitty and Pigs as Pigs, only with worse pacing and worse timing. Most of this cartoon just doesn't really feel like much of anything, and the ending gag in theory should be funny, but the execution of it just completely falls flat on its face. Also, I really hate these backgrounds that just look so overly cartoony and flat, and, if I'm being completely honest, looks unfinished. Feather Bluster. This is... another clip show? Just... why? Just... just why? And the sad thing is, this is not a terrible idea for a cartoon. A geriatric foghorn and dog reminiscing on their old rivalry, but... Did you absolutely have to reuse old clips? Why not just use new slapstick gags using the framing device as a way to tie it all together? This one's not really unpleasant to sit through, it's just lazy. Now hair this. I really, really wish they would stop with these fairy tale parodies. They were funny at first, but this is getting really desperate. This is sloppy, poorly written, and most of the gags are just recycling from older ones. They're out of ideas. Also, as I already mentioned, Bob McKimson's cartoons just feel so lethargic as if that creative spark that he once had is just gone, and so is going through the motions. It's honestly kind of sad to see. To Itch His Own Probably one of Chuck Jones's more overlooked one-shots. While not told as masterfully as some of his other one-shots, this is still really good. It's a great story, told very well, with decent enough slapstick. In particular, I love this jaw drop right here. And amazing sound editing. Not quite some hidden masterpiece in the repertoire, but worth giving a chance regardless. Also, what is that? Dog Tales. Nothing more than attempting to go back to basics and presents nothing more than a series of cutaway gags centered around dogs, Tex Avery style. Unfortunately, we're at the point where they're not talented enough to make it work. Not helped by the fact is that most of these are jokes that they've already told before. Seriously, can we stop with this Doberman Pinscher joke? It was a barely passable enough pun as is. It is not clever enough to warrant repeat usage. And the original jokes it does have just come across as desperate. Also, this one is Charlie Dog's real final appearance, in what amounts to a cameo appearance. 
just in case you were curious. Nighty Night Bugs. It is so bizarre that out of all the Bugs Bunny cartoons out there, from his dozens and dozens of classic cartoons, that this is the only one of his that ended up winning the Academy Award for Best Short Subjects Cartoons. And it's not that it's a bad one, it's just, why this one? As a cartoon in and of itself, it's pretty good. The thing that makes this one stand out so much is this idea of a dragon that has a cold. And when he sneezes, he always sneezes fire. This moves at a good pace, has some solid slapstick, good camaraderie between Sam and Bugs, and a good reusing of the open and closing the drawbridge joke from Sahara Hair. It feels like a good old-fashioned old-school Bugs cartoon that doesn't do anything spectacularly, but is good and rock-solid. Also, this understated Sir Osis of Liver Gag is such a clever joke. One of the best puns they've had in a good long while. Weasel While You Work is it really possible that they've gone this far in the Looney Tunes catalog and they've never told a Foghorn Leghorn vs. Dog cartoon in the winter? That one change manages to open itself up to some new slapstick gags. And it's been quite a while since we've seen a good old-fashioned rivalry cartoon between these two, and it's still as enjoyable as it's ever been, even with slightly weaker animation. A Bird in a Bonnet With some of these later Sylvester and Tweety cartoons, there's a workmanlike quality to them, by this point, they were clearly made because they're popular and they kind of felt obligated to give the audience what they wanted, not necessarily because they had new ideas that they wanted to explore. It's not that they're bad, they're decent enough, it's just they're not that interesting and the passion has long since been extinguished. There are precisely zero standout moments, but nothing really done that badly either. Hook, Line, and Stinger as these Ronin cartoons have continued, it seems Chuck Jones has finally gotten the hint that he doesn't need to spend two to three minutes on the setup and instead just goes straight into the gags. More decently timed non-stop slapstick, although the gags in this one are a little lacking in surprise, but more often than not, the execution of the gag manages to make up for it. The Rube Goldberg machine at the end is a ton of fun. Pre-hysterical hair. This one is a genuine stinker. A very stupid premise with an overly complicated setup. Look, if you wanted to have bugs in prehistoric times, just have him in prehistoric times. There is no reason to have the framing device of bugs finding some film in a 12,000 year old time capsule. And also a really distracting Dave Barry doing a terrible Arthur Q. Bryan impression. And pretty horrendous animation that butchers the timing for the recycled slapstick gags and can't even be bothered to properly lip-sync the dialogue half the time. This one legitimately feels like it's unfinished. Go for Broke. Really, the most I can say about this one is that this one exists. Again, I have to iterate that a lot of these gags are recycled from older cartoons, only done with worse timing due to the lower animation quality. And in fact, this one is a much slower, more lethargic remake of Mouse Wreckers. And the ending is just off. It's a standard ending punchline, but the bad timing really botches the landing. Hip Hip Hurry. A very much going through the motions Coyote at Road Order cartoon. It's got a lot of energy and moves, but aside from this seesaw gag, there's not really any moments that stand out all that much. And admittedly, this blatant continuity error is really distracting. Cat Feud. The final Mark Anthony and Pussyfoot cartoon. While this one doesn't come close to matching their greatest of the first two offerings, this is still a good one for them to go out on. The construction setting provides a good enough change in scenery to help keep the story fresh and work in some good, well-timed slapstick jokes. And yeah, like the previous of their cartoons together, it's cute and not in a cloying way, while managing to work in tinges of cruelty for good measure. Baton Bunny Bugs Bunny does his best Walter White impression and goes up against his most formidable foe yet an ordinary housefly. This one is like a soft remake of Rhapsody Rabbit from 13 years prior, and while that one was better, this one still has a nice rhythm to it. I wouldn't necessarily call this one funny, but it is consistently enjoyable and manages to work in some good gags. As a side note, this is the first cartoon in a long time, since 1949 I believe, to have somebody other than Jones, Freeling, or McKimson in the director's chair with Abe Levitow, although Chuck Jones does still get top billing as director here. Again, here's just a neat little bit of trivia. Mouse Placed Kitten Again, this plot has been done before. 
Kind of a little bit of Lost and Foundling mixed with Feed the Kitty. But it's done kind of cute enough here. I kind of wish they'd done more with the mice raising the kitten, but what they choose to do gets the job done. Also, good grief does Junior's voice not match his design. China Jones. A very dated parody of China Smith. And not just because they're doing a parody of a show that, by and large, nobody cares about anymore. Although, granted, I've already sat through some of the most racist caricatures imaginable during this series, so this isn't particularly surprising, except for maybe giving Porky Pig Asian squinty eyes. The story's not particularly engaging and moves at a weird pace, and the gags aren't that great either, aside from this Dragon Lady bit. That one actually did make me laugh. Arabian Night. Oh, deep joy, another clip show. This time with Bugs acting out the role of Scheherazade as the framing device. There is practically nothing to say about this one except, I guess they picked some good clips. Trick or Tweet. Basically a much tamer repeat of Putty Tat Trouble. Although I do like this little twist that the cats are trying to be polite with each other at the start before they get considerably meaner. It's got a good solid build up to the whole thing. And also Tweety gets a genuinely funny one liner in here. When after the cats decide to put him back, he says, I'd like that too. The mouse that Jack built. This time the Looney Tunes actually got the real celebrities in this instance, Jack Benny, Mary Livingstone, Eddie Anderson, and Don Wilson to voice the parodies of themselves. I don't know how common this was back in the era, but this is, as far as I can tell, the first time that Looney Tunes did it. Now, of course, I expect this cartoon will have more meaning if you've actually seen the Jack Benny program, which admittedly I have not, because then you'd be able to catch the references that this thing tosses your way. But even as a cartoon, this one's still pretty enjoyable. It's got a good mixing of the Looney Tunes type of slapstick humor and the dry little slice of deadpan. And if nothing else, it's all worth it to see the live-action Jack Benny scared of a real-life cat. This one's a real charming one. Apes of Wrath. The thing that elevates this one is the real mean streak that runs throughout its entire runtime, From the stork kidnapping Bugs to buy himself some more time for failing to do his job, to the father gorilla trying to beat the crap out of Bugs even though he thinks he's his son, and only stopping because his wife threatens and follows through with physical abuse, and then Bugs taking advantage of this in order to torment the gorilla even further. This one is really funny and manages to work in several laugh out loud moments throughout. Hot Rod and Real. The opening gag showcases a level of self-awareness on the Coyote's part that no matter what he does, the universe is just going to punish him. And what is otherwise a largely unremarkable but average Roadrunner cartoon, this one contains what's always been one of my all-time favorite gags, and that's the trampoline gag. Just this idea of Wild E being trapped inside that trampoline is genuinely hilarious to me. A Mutt in a Rut. A cruel, almost downright sadistic deconstruction of the dangers of paranoia, and perhaps a not-so-subtle middle finger directed at aspects of modern psychiatry, the kind that winds up sowing discourse and animosity with your loved ones when no such issue existed in the first place, which winds up yielding a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. We also get to see Elmer in a very different sort of context than anything we've seen before, as we see him as just an everyman who just occasionally goes hunting. I actually kind of wish they utilized him more like this, as someone who is a genuinely decent, if kind of slow, average Joe. He fills that role just perfectly. And on top of that, the slapstick gags, while ones we've largely seen before, are handled very well. This is the first genuine surprise in quite some time, and probably one of the most underrated Looney Tunes cartoons out of their entire backlog. Although, admittedly, the title of this one doesn't really match the content, but that's me almost being nitpicky. Backwoods Bunny. If you want to watch Bugs go up against some country hicks, just watch Hillbilly Hair instead. It is much better than this one. This is slow, meandering, and not really that funny. Also, Bugs going up against buzzards again is reminding me of Beaky Buzzard. Note to all writers or filmmakers, do not remind me of something better that I could be watching instead. Really Scent. Chuck Jones' protege Abe Levitow tries his hand at directing a Pepe Le Pew cartoon, and also tells a story that's the least like any other Pepe Le Pew cartoon out there, discounting the obvious exception of Odor of the Day. For one, Penelope is the one who actually initiates the relationship this time around, 
and it's less a cartoon about Pepe being a creepy stalker to an unwilling suitor, but is more a cartoon about the societal expectations thrust upon women regarding relationships, with the female narrator in particular getting in some really scathing lines of dialogue, while also being a surprisingly sweet story about making reasonable changes for the sake of your partner, albeit in a kind of twisted, ironic Looney Tunes sense. This was exactly the shakeup to the formula that this series of cartoons desperately needed, which just goes to show that sometimes in order to reinvigorate something, all you need is for someone else to look at it with a fresh set of eyes and be willing to bend the rules a little bit. Mexicali Schmoes I greatly enjoyed Speedy's portrayal here as someone who intentionally puts himself in harm's way just to mess with and mock his enemies. I tend to think of Speedy as an example of a character who is fun to watch and elevates the cartoons he's in, but they usually don't pit him against fun or interesting villains, and such is the case here. He's good, and the slapstick is good, particularly this landmine bit, but the antagonist cats are boring. And of course we get a glimpse of Slowpoke Rodriguez, who leaves an impact despite only being in the cartoon for 30 seconds and not having any lines of dialogue. With better villains though, this one could have been a real classic. Tweet and Lovely. A perfectly standard Sylvester and Tweety outing. It kind of feels like something straight out of one of their older outings without any sort of gimmick. I mean, unless you count Sylvester being housed in a laboratory as a gimmick. And sometimes there is something to be said about the familiar as long as it's done well. And this one is done reasonably well, albeit without a ton of standout moments. Except for this retracting grabber bit. Also, Tweety, that is not what hypocrite means. Wild Wooly Hair. It's been a while since a good old-fashioned Bugs vs. Sam Western showdown, and while it's obvious this doesn't hit the classic levels as their older outings together, and the backgrounds are noticeably flatter in this compared to something like, say, Bugs Bunny Rides Again, this is still a real good treat. Great chemistry between these two, good slapstick timing, and a great bit where Bugs and Sam play a game of chicken with trains. There is also this hold my beer gag, which is a nice, darkly comedic moment. Cat's Paw. Here you get another typical Sylvester and Junior outing, but instead of going up against Hippity Hopper, Sylvester tries his hand at trying to capture a dwarf eagle. The conversations between father and son are very enjoyable, as Junior drips sarcasm in nearly every single line he says. And the ending gag is such a hilarious image in and of itself that it made me laugh, even though I knew it was coming, which is no small feat. Here today, Gone to Molly. This continues the trend of Speedy being the best thing in his cartoons, even when the writing and pacing is not quite up to par. Some of the gags are recycled from Speedy Gonzalez, but usually there's enough variation to put its own unique spin on it. Bonanza Bunny. Another fun Bugs Western outing. This one gets points for the 21 of Hearts gag, which is one of the best new gags that has been in these series of cartoons so far. Also, the big ending reveal that decontextualizes the entire cartoon in a very unexpected way actually makes this cartoon a lot funnier in hindsight. A Broken Leghorn The way this cartoon is set up is really bizarre. It starts out with Prissy being sad about the possibility that she can't lay an egg and the other hens gossip about her... infertility, I guess is the word I would use. Anyway, Foghorn catches wind of it, and sticks another hen's egg underneath Prissy to make her think that she laid an egg. Okay, it shows him being kind and compassionate. But then the egg hatches, and it turns out that it's a baby rooster. So then Foghorn becomes jealous and spends the rest of the cartoon trying to kill the baby rooster by any means necessary. And by the way, Prissy basically disappears from the cartoon by the halfway point, despite being set up as if the cartoon's going to be about her. I just... I don't know why it was structured in this way. Because you have Foghorn actually doing something nice for once, probably one of the nicest things that we've seen him do, which is then followed up by him attempting to do one of the worst things that he's ever done. It kind of creates this jarring juxtaposition that doesn't really feel intentional. Now, both of these segments of the cartoons are done quite well, most especially the second half, where we get some excellent hard-hitting Foghorn slapstick, and the meanest factor of him basically trying to commit the barnyard equivalent of infanticide adds a tinge of cruelty that I'm not even 100% sure the creators were aware of. Although when you know what happens to the overwhelming majority of male rooster chicks on a farm, yeah, that knowledge kind of adds an extra level of cruelty on top of it. It's still a really good funny cartoon, but yeah, the composition of this one is just downright bizarre. Wild About Hurry 
It's the steel ball gag that really makes this one work, as just when you think it's going to end, it just keeps going and going and going, furthering the coyote's torment. The rest of this one is passable, but this one gag really does the heavy lifting this time. A Witch's Tangled Hair While it's usually fun to watch Witch, Hazel, and Bugs bounce off of each other, I can't really say this one's plot is all that engaging, and the pacing is kind of off-kilter, and all the Shakespeare references feel pretty forced. A kind of watchable Bugs outing, but not one you're going to want to return to either. Unnatural History A passable series of blackout gags, although admittedly I am really starting to get sick of this pigeons flying out the window gag. But this beaver damming a river gag more than makes up for it. But, no, seriously, where was the master for all these years? Who leaves home for three years and then suddenly pops back up unexpectedly? I know it's a cartoon, but this bothers me. Tweet Dreams. Yet another clip show. Okay, I get it. Warner Brothers had to save money somewhere. But I just wish that if they were going to do clip shows like this, that they would at least pick better clips. But this one's bizarre because we briefly get a flashback to an old Hippity Hopper cartoon where Sylvester plays Sylvester's father and Junior plays a young Sylvester. That's honestly pretty difficult to wrap your head around. Although, I guess it is proof that Junior did indeed have to go to therapy after enduring the shame of his father constantly being beat up by a big mouse. And this attempt at recreating a scene from Sandy Claus looks hilariously awful. But it also picks a great clip from Tweety's Circus. And the ending to this one is just... I don't even know how to describe it. People are bunny. By and large, a scattershot of ideas, but no real coherent plot to tie it all together. If they wanted to do blackout gags involving television shows, they should have just done that. Although it is worth it just for this gag involving Daffy trying to help an old lady cross the street. Also, continuity error alert, Daffy pulls Bugs' shotgun off the wall, only for it to suddenly reappear in the background in the next shot. And it is with this cartoon that we leave the 1950s behind. Home to some of the greatest cartoons of all time, and we enter the era of... the 1960s. I hope this doesn't hurt too much. Fastest with the mostest. I am all for Chuck Jones including slapstick gags during the title card of these. I can't really say this one has many standout gags, but honestly, as long as they get the timing of these right, it's hard to mess these up. And thankfully, if there's one thing that Chuck Jones knows how to do, at least at this point in his career, it's time a slapstick gag. West of the Pecos. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Wait a second. I think I got this quote from Ecclesiastes mixed up with my review of this cartoon. Anyway, regardless, it's fitting. Because this feels like a rehash of the typical Speedy vs. Sylvester outing, with virtually nothing new here to make it stand out. I am really starting to get sick of them repeating the opening of all of Speedy's cartoons almost verbatim. We get it. He's the fastest mouse in all of Mexico, and yeah, he's friends with everybody's sister. We get it. Horse hair. You know, if you're gonna have an Indian raid cartoon, complete with all the Native American stereotypes that you could possibly think of, could you at least have the decency to make it, I don't know, funny? I have no idea why they thought this one little, two little, three little Indians joke was so funny that it needed to be included in every single Indian raid cartoon. Oh, except in this cartoon where Bugs erases half a point because one of the Indians he shot was a half-breed. Oh, wow, that, that is, is so uncomfortable. Also, why is Yosemite Sam leading the charge with the Indians? That's honestly just confusing. Wild Wild World. This one is just so boring. I'm not saying this was definitely the case, but this feels like a cartoon that felt like an assignment from a higher up that nobody involved wanted to actually make. I don't feel any sense of passion behind this at all. The elevator gag in its payoff is mildly amusing, but that's about it. Also, insert obligatory Flintstones gag, and I also find it really bizarre that both this and prehistorical hair include this idea that cavemen were somehow capable of producing feature films instead of just having a series of gags set in prehistoric times. Goldie Mouse and the Three Cats What's strange about this one is that it starts off as a parody of Goldilocks and the Three Bears before it just devolves into another typical chase cartoon. 
I'm still not sure why the composition was the way it was, since having this be a Goldilocks parody doesn't add anything. But at least the slapstick is actually done very well here. I especially love this shelter joke. That actually made me laugh pretty hard. Person to Bunny. This one is a more than adequate enough cartoon. One part parody of Person to Person, another in which Daffy tries to take the spotlight away from Bugs, and another where Elmer Fudd chases after Bugs after being publicly humiliated on live television. Although, are they supposed to be actors in this cartoon? Because if not, then why exactly is Bugs famous? And if they are actors, then why are they acting like Bugs and Elmer were actual rivals? Eh, I'm probably overthinking this one just a little bit. It's decently paced and overall has a few good chuckles. And with this cartoon, we bid a sad farewell to Arthur Q. Bryan in his final appearance as Elmer Fudd, after having passed away from a heart attack several months prior to this cartoon's release. And it's perhaps fitting that in his final performance, Elmer was left right in the middle of one of his and Bugs' classic routines, in this case, the log gag. Who sent you? As far as Pepe Le Pew cartoons go that don't stray too far from the formula, this one's passable enough. Probably the most interesting thing about this one is, apparently in this universe, skunks are so repulsive that a bunch of people would be willing to drown themselves rather than be forced to smell their stench. It really does make you wonder, just how badly does Pepe actually stink? Hide and Go Tweet. This is basically a remake of Dr. Jerkle's Hide, except if it was a Sylvester and Tweety cartoon. Honestly, this is such a clever take on a popular dynamic that it more than makes up for it. This cartoon manages to keep itself fresh, and the timing and reactions on everything is done rather well. Rabbit's Feet. You know what's really bizarre about this cartoon? The fact that Chuck Jones brought back the Wild E. Coyote and Bugs Bunny rivalry, despite the fact that Wild E. had been firmly established as the silent butt monkey whose mortal enemy is the Roadrunner. You know what's even more bizarre? The Bugs that we see in this cartoon feels nothing like the more laid-back, almost bored portrayal of the late 1950s. This one's much more like his typical screwball personality of the 40s, with much of his dialogue being made up of non-sequiturs, and moving around like his old zany self, like when he uses his ears as a corkscrew. Anyway, this is fast-moving, old-school insanity, and has a lot of great moments and lines. I don't know why, but Bugs' line about how he's allergic to drowning really got to me. Crockett Doodle Doo. This is another Foghorn and Egghead Jr. cartoon, and much like their second outing together, this one is trying really hard to capture the magic of their first cartoon together. But the animation and timing at this point is getting so sloppy that it didn't have a chance of getting anywhere near as good. And the backgrounds in this one feel particularly flat for some reason. A trend that I am certain is going to continue the further into the 60s we get. Mouse and Garden. This is basically the same exact setup as Trick or Tweet, albeit with a mouse instead of Tweety Bird. Overall, this is a passable little cartoon, but nothing to write home about. Ready, Woolen, and Abel. After a three-year absence, Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog are back. And once again, I am left with so many questions about their working relationship, especially since they apparently work for the same company. But Ralph Wolf has a nicer car than Sam. I think I'm going to make it my headcanon that Ralph has been hired to run security tests to make sure that Sam is actually doing his job, and Sam resents the company for doing so, and by paying Ralph more than him for doing so, and is taking it out on Ralph. Does anybody want to try to prove me wrong? And then there's the ending where Ralph says that he'll be there for work tomorrow, despite being shipped off to the psych ward. Is this Chuck Jones making a commentary about corporate America? How they expect you to return to work the next day regardless of what injuries might have been incurred while you're on the clock? Honestly, probably not, but you know what? I'll take the subtext any place I can get it. Mice Follies I'm actually surprised they made another Honey Mousers cartoon especially since the original show had already been off the air for four years by this point. It's another one that's watchable-ish, but not really that funny, and nothing particularly noteworthy about it. From Hair to Air. So this is where A Christmas Story and Home Alone got the idea for gibberish swearing. I love just how mean Bugs is being in this cartoon. He is literally given total power over Sam's finances, and decides to take the opportunity to just do whatever rude thing pops into his head. This setup is genius to the point that I'm actually wondering why they hadn't thought of it beforehand. But yeah, this is good stuff, and the ending is the perfect amount of cruel. 
the Dixie Friar. The buzzards from Backwoods Bunny are back, only this time they're going up against Foghorn Leghorn instead of bugs. Except here, they're chicken hawks instead of buzzards. And yeah, they're still a rather annoying duo, but I think they work better against Foghorn than bugs, mainly because they're more evenly matched, and so the gags are slightly more unpredictable. Hop along casualty. First of all, the Roadrunner should never be filmed from this angle. That is just way too close. Second of all, the credits for this one were presented extremely confusing. So much so that I initially thought that they forgot to include a title card. They put the credits first, and then they included the title. I actually don't think they've done that before, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, most of the gags at the start are pretty standard, but the one that makes this one is the Earthquake Pills gag. The build-up to it and the subsequent execution is nothing short of remarkable. Trip for Tat. Another quasi-clip show in which the plot is more or less an excuse to reuse as much animation from older Sylvester and Tweety cartoons as humanly possible. And I say quasi-clip show because they don't really use the older footage per se, but rather they actually reuse the animation and put it over a brand new background. So... I guess congrats on putting in some extra effort this time. The only thing that makes this one worth it is the gag where Sylvester has his face erased and has to have it restored via a tattoo artist. Doggone people. Hal Smith, I love you. You were a talented voice actor, but a replacement for Arthur Q. Bryan, you are not. All things considered, it would have been less distracting to just use Mel Blank to voice Elmer Fudd. It's not like he was incapable of it based on his performance in the Scarlet Pumpernickel. Or better yet, just retire the character altogether out of respect for Brian. Anyway, this is a very stupid premise done in such a sluggish, dull, repetitive execution. The dialogue in this one is especially painful, as Elmer's lines feel like someone trying to imitate the way Elmer would talk. The drunk driving joke could have been funny if the animation was better. High Note Here's something a little bit different, a nice experimental piece that features trippy animation, great gags, incredible rhythm, and is brimming with character. It's nice to know that even as the Looney Tunes were starting to hit their slump, every once in a while something exciting and fresh will pop its head around the corner. Lighter than hair. Okay, I have just one little question, one teensy weensy little question. I mean, it's a minor thing all kings considered, but I do think it is worth bringing up. Why, 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 why was the visitor from outer space played by Yosemite Sam instead of, I don't know, just throwing this off the top of my head, Marvin the Martian? That one detail is just so distracting that you don't even believe that this is real. This feels more like a post-Golden Era Looney Tunes cartoon made by someone trying to emulate the old-school Looney Tunes style. But no, this was made by Frizz Freeling. The concept of this one is just completely broken, and the slapstick is not really that great either. Cannery Woe. It's the pacing that really kills this one. It takes a full four minutes before the rivalry between Speedy and Sylvester actually starts. And even when it does get into the swing of things, the gags aren't that good. Also, a politician that actually keeps his promises? What kind of fantasy world does this take place in? Zip and Snort. The one thing I like about some of these Roadrunner cartoons is that a gag can take as long as it needs to, or it can be in and out as quickly as it came. Again, not any gags that really stand out, but they're on the same level of, yeah, this was good. Hoppy Days. Once you've seen one Hippity Hopper cartoon, you've pretty much seen them all. The gags are passable, but unless you're a fan of this formula, there's really no reason to watch this, especially considering the fact that the animation is considerably weaker here than in their previous entries in this series. The Mouse on 57th Street. The plot of this one doesn't really feel that organic. If Chuck Jones just wanted to tell a story about a mouse trying to steal a diamond and trying to run away from the cops, I'm not sure why he felt the need to include the overly convoluted setup of the mouse getting hung over after eating a rum cake and then overhearing two construction workers talk about a diamond and then having him mistake it for a piece of ice. It just feels kind of forced, even by the standards of cartoon logic. And the slapstick here is... Fine, but not that great either. Strangled Eggs. This is basically what happens if you take the opening from Little Boy Boo and took the second half of Broken Leghorn and replaced that baby chick with Henry Hawk. 
Foghorn deciding to murder Henry weirdly doesn't feel that out of character. Although it is a little weird that Henry tries to eat Foghorn from the very beginning, and yet Prissy makes Foghorn out to be the bad guy for not wanting a chicken hawk to be raised on their farm. The slapstick here is fine, although admittedly this landmine gag is pretty poorly timed. Birds of a Father Junior learns the tough lesson that the best way to deal with a prejudicial parent is not to reason with them and not to try to show them that their way of thinking is wrong, but rather to just lie to their face and try to trick them. That, that, that's the message I was meant to take away from this, right? Anyway, it's got a great plot and some decent well-timed slapstick, and it's always great to see Junior in something other than a hippity hopper cartoon. I kind of wish he'd been utilized more often. Defighten Ones an okay-ish, but not really all that special parody of the Defiant Ones. I kind of feel like more could have been done with the setup, because this is actually one of the more inspired ideas they've had in a while, but it does its job decently enough. The Abominable Snow Rabbit. Watching Bugs and Daffy going together on a trip, only to once again throw each other under the bus the instant a problem rears its ugly head, is just absolute perfection. The Abominable Snowman is such a fun character to watch, and the many different ways that he can abuse Daffy is really enjoyable to watch. This also contains one of my absolute favorite Daffy Duck quotes of all time, wherein he tries to justify to himself turning bugs over to the snowman by saying that, you know, Daffy's not like other people. He can't stand pain because it hurts him. That one line in particular leapfrogs this an entire rating for me. Lickety Splat. I can't be the only one who thinks that the coyote looks off here, right? Anyway, as far as these Roadrunner cartoons, though, it's pretty okay, although some of these gags feel a little forced, even by cartoon logic standards. Like this gag where the coyote throws an exploding dart at a target, and instead of throwing them at the Roadrunner, he just gets into a hot air balloon and just drops them, hoping that one of them will hit the Roadrunner. Um, okay. Ascent of the Matterhorn. There's a couple of interesting things to note with this Pepe Le Pew outing. For starters, this one includes the small little detail of Penelope actually being, at the very least, semi-receptive to his advances, at least until she actually gets a whiff of his stench. Personally, I think that one detail actually goes a long way in making Pepe's cartoons quite a bit more palatable. Also, there are some genuinely funny one-liners in this one. Like when Pepe says that one of his hobbies is making love, and much like for sentimental reason, he mistakes Penelope's suicide attempt as a way for her to express her love for him. Only this time he doesn't try to prevent it. Also, there's this ending gag where Pepe thinks that he's somehow come across an entire harem of female skunks. Kinda makes me picture what he attempted to do with all those blocks of ice. It would certainly give a whole new meaning to the expression blue balls. Rebel Without Claws so this is like a Sylvester and Tweety cartoon, except it takes place in the Confederacy, with Tweety working for the Confederate Army, and Sylvester working for the Union Army. That's... certainly a decision. Anyway, this one's actually got a few laughs to it, like this cannonball gag, and this really twisted image of Tweety about to be executed via a firing squad. Compressed Hair Wally and Bugs commence in yet another battle of wits, and bizarrely, the two of them also take the time to engage in a wordplay game as they try to outpun each other. And the ending punchline gives a nice little nod to the Cold War space race that was ongoing at the time. The Pied Piper of Guadalupe. Looney Tunes has done other Pied Pipers type stories before this, most prominently Paying the Piper, but it was perhaps inevitable that they would want to give the story another go when you consider by this time Speedy Gonzalez had become an established character. Honestly, though, Sylvester is such an idiot in this cartoon, being so suicidally overconfident in his abilities that, quite frankly, he deserves everything that he gets here. In this one, there's just enough on the twist of the Speedy and Sylvester dynamic to make it worthy of a watch. Although, what is up with the sound effect in this scene? It genuinely sounds like they added a fart sound effect to the lake bubbling like this. Prince Violent I like the elephant as a character in this one. That's about the only noteworthy thing in here. This is another one of those bugs in Yosemite Sam outings that generally feels like it's just going through the motions. There's not really any attempt at pushing the formula forward, no attempt at telling a joke that we haven't seen before, and no attempt to actually get the timing just right. 
merely settling for adequate instead. Daffy's in trouble. Daffy feels that he's being underappreciated as an employee, and so he decides to break away to run his own business, only to realize that he perhaps wasn't as business savvy as he originally thought, and so he decides to try to sabotage his business rival instead of actually trying to improve his own business skills. It's got a decent amount of funny jokes, especially the ending punchline that actually went in a direction that I was not expecting. What's my lion? This is definitely one of those Death Rattle cartoons. A cartoon that is so aggressively mediocre, and one that you can tell is a product of a once popular animation studio desperately trying to capture the re-magic of their glory days, while simultaneously working with a lower budget, a crew long since past their prime, and the fact that one of their mainstay voice actors had passed away. It's not funny, it's poorly timed, and really comes across as more depressing than anything else. Beep Prepared This era of cartoons has been pretty wildly inconsistent, but if nothing else, at least these Wily e. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons are steady. They don't reinvent a thing, but the timing on these are almost always great, and the formula here actually feels more comforting and puts you at ease, rather than feeling like a sign of inherent laziness or budget cuts. You know, which was likely at least part of the reason why there are so many Roadrunner cartoons during this time. But regardless, you just get the feeling like the crew just wanted to make the audience laugh at a few dumb slapstick gags, and then move on. The Last Hungry Cat The cartoon that finally asked the age-old question, what would happen if one of the Looney Tunes' staple antagonists actually managed to accomplish their lifelong goal, and then afterwards felt guilt about it? And not just regular old guilt either, but soul-crushing, spiraling depression that borders on a full-blown manic episode. And rather fittingly, this also happens to work as a fantastic parody of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Hitchcock himself loved stories about the darkest recesses of the human mind, and how the guilt associated with crimes could be just as much a prison as the physical punishment for said crimes. And so this is a case where the parody and the subject material work hand in hand in harmony. And the angles and lighting and the shadows in this one make it very clear that extra care was put into making this one stand out among its peers. Somewhat gothic, almost Kafka-esque in terms of cruelty, and also very, very funny. This honestly feels like it could have been the finale to the Sylvester and Tweety cartoons. In my opinion, it certainly would have been a fitting end to this classic duo. Nellie's Folly A surprisingly character-driven commentary about the pitfalls of the entertainment industry. From being exploited by those looking to make a quick buck, to the loneliness that comes from being at the top, and the importance of maintaining a squeaky clean image in the eyes of the public in order to stay relevant. And I kind of like how Nellie's decision to have an affair with a married giraffe could be interpreted as her essentially sabotaging her own career due to having become dissatisfied with where she ended up. Honestly, the infidelity in and of itself being included at all is pretty shocking. It's a great story told extremely well, and even manages to work in a more than a few decent jokes. Literally, the one place where this cartoon really struggles with is with the animation. You can definitely tell this was made during an era where their budget cuts were seriously hurting the overall product. Like this shot where the confetti is clearly not moving, and the audience applauding here just looks completely off. That's a shame because if this was made, say, in the early to mid-50s, I think this could have been just as much of a household name as One Froggy Evening. Wet Hair Bugs Bunny decides to try his hand at eco-terrorism by destroying a dam. Three separate times. It's by and large a pretty standard cartoon for the most part, although the ending gag is actually pretty funny and elevates it enough to watchable. A Sheep in the Deep. Watch for the really bizarre but surprisingly effective work dynamic between Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog. Stay for the fun slapstick gags. These two aren't quite as much of a household name as the other Chase cartoon duos, but honestly, they deserve to be. And watching them take their lunch and smoke break together is surprisingly wholesome. And this gag in which they keep revealing disguises is a great bit. Fish and Slips I apologize for every bad thing that I've ever said about Sylvester Jr. His passive-aggressive nature and sarcastic quips are quite funny. Maybe he just needed to get out of the tired hippity-hopper formula for his personality to really shine through. Also, I love the fact that he almost kills his own father because he got distracted by a worm. Anyway, this is some good solid slapstick gags. Nothing fantastic, but it more than gets the job done. Quackadile Tears And we have Art Davis returning for one final foray in the director's chair after a 13-year absence, 
or rather in 13 years of working in Frizz Freeling's unit, and he apparently made this in spare time while he was working for Hanna-Barbera. Why? I don't know. Anyway, this one is by and large passable. It's got a few slapstick moments, although this largely takes elements from the hand-pecked duck, although it adds a bit of a typical cartoon chase into the mix for good measure. Crow's Feet. The two stupid crows from Two Crows from Tacos are back, and they're nowhere near as amusing as they were in that cartoon. Actually, if anything, they're pretty annoying here. Most of the runtime is them trying to argue with a scarecrow, and that's it. There's nothing clever or amusing about any of it. It's just slow, plodding, and the very little slapstick that is in here is so poorly timed. And then the cartoon just kind of stops. The only really noteworthy thing about this is that this one includes Elmer Fudd's final appearance in what amounts to little more than a silent cameo. And in a really out of character moment is very much on top of things. And even has characterization very much like a stereotypical karmic trickster. I do wish his last appearance in a cartoon was better, but it was nice to see a silent version of the character one last time before he was retired. Mexican Borders. It turns out you can actually make a great Speedy vs. Sylvester cartoon if you mix up the formula a little bit. Wow, what a novel concept. Reintroducing Slowpoke Rodriguez and making him Speedy's cousin was an excellent idea, as it manages to alter the dynamic ever so slightly while also keeping the core of what made the Speedy and Sylvester chase cartoons so much fun in the first place. And yeah, the camaraderie and back and forth between Speedy and Slowpoke, both great characters in their own right, makes for some real enjoyable back and forth. Alright guys, part 9 has finally come to a close. We made it, we are now officially in the 1960s. Now, if you take a look at this graph, you can see that there's been a noticeable dip in quality. Like many people pointed out in the comments, a lot of it can be pointed back to the budget cuts. Them trying to save money any way that they can, which they did either by doing clip shows or even just reusing animation whenever possible and taking shortcuts. And yeah, cutting the animation budget is going to have an impact, especially when a lot of what made the Looney Tunes work is its timing. By this point, the animation is noticeably choppier, and sometimes character poses when they're not moving don't look quite right, and the backgrounds in some cartoons look unfinished. And the animation cycles are also more obvious. And like I mentioned in the last video, I don't necessarily think this is just a budget problem. I also think that some of it, particularly when it comes to the writing and the gags, can be explained as the result of burnout. I mean, constantly making cartoons for almost two decades straight, consistently, has got to put you a bit out of sorts. And trying to keep the machine moving and coming up with new stories and scenarios and new gags, yeah, it's probably not too big of a surprise that Part 9 dipped as much as it did. But even with all that over its head, this part still manages to work in some genuinely great cartoons, including some that I don't think get the attention that they deserve. A Mutt in a Rut, Really Scent, The Last Hungry Cat, Rabbit's Feet, Nellie's Folly, A Sheep in the Deep, all great, highly overlooked cartoons that you should check out if you haven't already. And of course, there was the classic What's Opera Doc that started this entire part off. And then there was the classic Roadrunner cartoons that are, as of this moment, putting out some of their most consistently good products. So this era was still very much capable of hitting home runs, they just sadly weren't as consistent as they had been in the past. Of course, we only have one part left to go before we reach the very end. And with it, we are going to be saying goodbye to all the remaining Looney Tunes characters one by one. Several directors will be leaving us prematurely. Chuck Jones will be directing his final cartoon after being fired by Warner Brothers in 1962. And we'll also get to the slightly dreaded Depade Freeling era, followed by the pretty much universally reviled Seven Arts era. I don't think the question's going to be, can we possibly see an improvement over last time, but rather, just how bad did the Looney Tunes get before they were finally put to rest? But we won't know for sure until we actually get through the remaining cartoons. And I guess that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to be notified of when Part 10 comes out, make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss it. Anyway... Have a good day, and I'll see you next time.